Awesome. Well, let's get started here and we can uh, let people come in from the waiting room as they join as well. Um, but hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome to the Our Studio Enterprise Community Meetup, our energy meetup today. I'm Rachel I'm calling in from Boston. I'm actually at the Our Studio office today in the seaport. If you just joined now, feel free to introduce yourselves through the chat window and say hello maybe where you're calling in from. I like to just let people know at the beginning, if you wanna turn on live transcription for the meetup, you can do so in the Zoom bar below if you just press more. Um, but to go through a brief agenda, we'll have uh, some short, short introductions of the meetup and welcome everyone here. Our introduction to functional data analysis with Santiago Rodriguez. And then lots of time for questions and open discussion at the end as well. So just a reminder, this meetup will be recorded too. So it will be shared to the R Studio YouTube. I'll put it in the meetup discussion and on LinkedIn. So to ask questions, if you don't wanna be part of the recording, you can always use the Slido link that I'll share in just a moment in the chat. Yeah, you could put your name in there too if, if you want and I can call on you to ask the question live. Um, or you could ask anonymously. But for anybody joining for the first time, welcome. This is a friendly and open meetup meet environment for teams to share the work they're doing within their organizations, teach lessons learned, network with each other, really just allow us all to learn from each other. So thank you all so much for making this a welcoming community too. We really want this to be a space where everybody can participate. We can hear from everyone regardless of your level of experience or the industry that you work in. So if you ever have suggestions or general feedback, please let me know too. I'll share a few other links in the chat as well where you can do so. But with that, thank you all again for joining us. I would love to turn it over to our speaker, Santiago Rodriguez. Santiago uh, and I are friends from LinkedIn. That's actually how we first met. Santiago is a data scientist in the marketing department at Consumers Energy, a Michigan-based public utility. Hi, Thank Rachel. You. Hi, everybody. And that's exactly right. I reached out to Rachel one day because she had a really interesting post on some functions in R that I hadn't heard of before. I thought they were great. So I just sent a, a cool post and uh, just ended up here. Maybe that's inspirational for somebody. If you have something you want to share, reach out. There's a community. Um, okay, so let's get started. Our agenda today is going to cover some introductions. I'm going to introduce myself, the topic, a little bit about consumers' energy because I'm using some of their data. So I wanted to give them a shout out, um, a definition as to what functional data analysis is, and then the meat of the presentation is really examples and applications of the present of a functional data analysis, this, this method of analysis. And then we'll wrap up with some resources in case anybody's interested in how I got started. All right, allow me to introduce myself uh, a little bit further. I was born in Ecuador, South America. I saw somebody in the chat was from Colombia. Hello, neighbor. Um, I grew up in South Florida. And I've lived in Dallas, Texas for seven years or so. Uh, I have a bachelor's from Florida State University and a master's in statistics from Texas A&M. I currently work as a data scientist in marketing. Um, and I've had the pleasure of working across different industries, primarily because I'm a learner and I, I, uh, I love learning new things in different industries, different functions. And then when I'm not at work, I'm primarily reading. Uh, usually stats books. And if it's not stats books, it's uh, fiction, nonfiction. Um, I like to travel this year. My wife and I have dedicated time to traveling and I love the fish. I grew up in South Florida. You know, there's a body of water in, uh, around every corner. Allow me to introduce Consumers Energy. Uh, they're sort of, they're the sponsor of the data for this presentation. It's a public utility founded in Michigan. They serve the majority of Michigan's um, residents and have a generation capacity of about six gigawatts. 
And then about today, uh, my talk will be primarily descriptive, non-technical. We won't get into math or code really. It's all about what is uh, functional data analysis and how can you use it? What are applications? And my goal today is to introduce this relatively young branch of statistics um, and then show you that it has value, that it can add value, that it's worth your time to explore and uh, maybe learn as well. And I got started with this. I wanted to share that really quickly. I'm by no means an expert on functional data analysis. I've just been uh, playing around with this stuff for a few months, probably close to a year. And um, in the utility space, meter reads are our primary data source for a lot of things. And uh, the time series nature of, of, um, of meter reads allow you to do a couple of different interesting things. If you're a time series person, you have decompositions and other more traditional stuff. I found that uh, functional data analysis with meter reads was such a perfect combination. And I'll show you some of these examples um, in a bit. As far as logistics, I've added little breakpoints into the presentation, partly to give me a break, uh, get a glass of water if I need. And if you have any questions, you can ask a question um, in that section. That way you don't forget or I don't forget what the heck I was talking about. And maybe it's a little bit more relevant in that point in time. All right, first up, uh, this is, an academic section, sort of. It's a definition. What can we do with functional data analysis? It's the only uh, math formula formula you'll see today, and it's useful upfront before we get into applications to define what this is, what functional data analysis is. And FDA is uh, that's the acronym FDA, functional data analysis. It's an analysis of information on curves and functions. For our purposes today, we're going to highlight curves. Um, but if you work in, let's say, with spatial data, you can use functions um, as well. Uh, function, functional data analysis is essentially a non-parametric flexible regression technique that is used to approximate a curve. You know what? Give me a second. OK, here we go. Um, it's used to approximate a curve or a function via a linear combination of basis functions. It looks like a regression formula. You have coefficients and uh, points, right, data. In this case, there's a, there's a slight tweak where what we're trying to do is using these red dots, in this case, these are meter reads, our data. Using the data, we're going to fit a curve, right? We're going to approximate a curve using basis functions. And that's that phi function in the formula. It's that non-parametric function and it has the form of the bottom right graph. It looks like lines. Um, and that's, that's essentially it. Uh, I don't wanna get too into the weeds here. You have a formula, you have uh, coefficient, coefficients that you estimate. Uh, you can do your usual stuff like uh, these squares. Um, and then you have these, the key here is these, this phi function that does something that creates these curves, right? And then you fit your data to, with those. Naturally, the question is, all right, we fit these curves, now what can we do with these curves? And it turns out you can do quite a bit, actually. You can do descriptive stats, max, min, median, variance, uh, confidence intervals. You can do interpolation uh, things, such as connecting the dots, right? If you have meter reads and you wanna show uh, a line, instead of using the default plotting method, you could use functional data analysis and connect the dots with a little bit, a little bit more smoothly. You can do extrapolation, uh, functional, that looks like functional regression if you want to do some inferential type work. If you're doing some predictive work, you can use GAMS. If you've ever used that, you're using functional data analysis on the back end that uses uh, cubic splines. Um, a relatively newer approach is clustering. You can cluster the curves. And then if you're doing uh, time series analyses, you can use some of these techniques as part of that as well. And here's the pitch, right? Uh, I think it's worthwhile to explore functional data analysis. I know I found it useful and it's another tool in your toolbox. 
and if a question comes along from a stakeholder or something, you find something you have potentially a better fitting tool for the job. And if you've ever worked with your hands or you've ever built anything, you know that the right tool makes the job so much easier. Um, as far as fitting the curve, as far as the, the method goes, it's quite flexible. It uh, allows you to fit a curve via those that phi function, right? That uh, non parametric function, a number of different ways. Uh, four year bases are really good for um, periodic data. In this case, meter reads tend to be periodic or semi periodic. There's some kind of cyclicality to things. So it's, a, it's good for that. B e splines, uh, a common word, cubic splines, wavelets, et cetera. And then it's not only about fitting the curve, it's about fitting the right curve, right? You want to make sure you've uh, you fit, uh, you've accounted for residuals, you're fitting the right curve, you're not overfitting, you're not underfitting. And there's a couple of ways to fit the optimal curve. You have uh, mean squares uh, methodology, as well as a penalization technique. And then arguably the coolest thing about functional data analysis and the curves that you fit is that those curves are differential. Now, uh, at first I didn't realize how useful that could be. Um, and I kind of glossed over it. And I've recently gone back and learned more and I've explored that area further because it opens up a treasure chest of information. I think some areas uh, have experience working with derivatives. For example, engineers might look at rates of change. Um, physicists use derivatives often, right? But if you work, uh, like I've worked primarily in, uh, in commercial functions, marketing, finance, operations. I haven't had a need that to, to look at derivatives, but it really is interesting. And I have an example of that uh, in a bit. So we have our first stopping point. I don't know if there are any questions. If not, I'm just gonna grab a glass of water. I can check over on Slido, but just to remind everyone, if you wanna ask questions either anonymously or with your name, um, you can do so on Slido, and I'll put the link in the chat again. Um, but the short link is rstd.io slash meetup dash questions. Put that and, uh, there again. There's a question in the chat here about overfitting. That's, that's definitely possible. If you were going to do any sort of, uh, if you were just connecting the dots, and you probably wouldn't care too much about the fit, but if you're doing anything inferential or you, you wanted um, to take into account for overfitting or underfitting, I would suggest uh, doing a like, sp split the data, uh, your typical hypertuning, try different uh, number of basis functions, see which one has the, uh, the least, uh, the best, uh, like sum of squares error. You could also use the penalization technique. That's, I found that to be probably the best approach. Um, you could you could fully you can fit a fully parameterized model, uh, but with the penalty, you're, you account for the, the overfitting or underfitting. Um, so I found that to be more powerful. I don't know if that was, that was a, I don't want to get like too into the weeds, but hopefully that answers your question. Uh, in short, in summary, there are ways to account and address underfitting and overfitting. Um, hey, thanks, Santiago. And feel free to uh, unmute yourself if you want to add context to questions to you or, or raise your hand on Zoom and I can call on you. Um, it should let you unmute yourself. Uh, there was an anonymous question that was, what is the sample size you need to fit the curves? Good question. Uh, let's see. I am working on stuff on the side. So everything I'm sh I'll share after this section are snippets of applications that I'm working on uh, as proof of concepts at work. Um, and I've worked with millions of records because uh, you figure time series data can go, and it gets so big, so fast. Um, or you can work with just 24 points, right? If, I, if I'm working with summarized meter reads, let's say I have, um, that's actually a really funny question because it, it's a perfect segue into the next section. Um, let's say I have a year's worth of meter reads. I summarize them by day, right? So I do the, uh, the mean by hour for the 24 hours, and I'll end up with 24 points. 
Right. That's like the the slide, the picture we saw earlier with those red dots. There are 24 red dots, one for each of the day, each of the hours. That's all, that's all you need to fit the curve. Um, if you wanted to do a little bit more, maybe some inferential work like build confidence intervals, then just having those 24 summarized points won't do you any good because you have no way to construct um, like a standard deviation. You don't have uh, that a sigma matrix. So you can work with, uh, you'll see this in a second. You can work with the summarized information in just the 24 points in this example, or you can work with all the data and then you have uh, access to more information. You can do a little bit more, uh, but depending on your machine, depending on your hardware, that gets pretty out of control quickly. Um, now I'll show you in a second. I'll, I'll try to remember to bring that up. Yeah, I, I noticed, you, well, you mentioned that's a good segue into the next one. So we can save some of the questions for the next pause too. Yeah, that's it. Yes, thank you. If, if you see something in the in, the, in this section that sparks in a further conversation on, on that previous question or any other question, just put in the chat and we'll address it. And uh, Nahal makes a good point. If you are doing a machine learning type of thing, you do want to separate your test and train. That's I feel like that's that's a whole topic of its own. So I won't, I won't go there, but yes, you should. Um, okay. So we we were talking about summarizing. The, the time series data and in, in the, the utility space, I found that this is probably the most common way to do that. It's called the daily load profile. Um, it is a way to summarize the consumption information to easily see uh, trends, right? And there's a couple of different ways to do this. Load has different definitions and uh, consumption, demand, the approach here, this functional data analysis technique, it works for however you choose to summarize the data. Um, I'm in marketing, so I, I tend to use the mean or uh, some kind of like centrality type measure, mean, median to summarize, but you could do the max if you're more focused on uh, the grid and electrical generation capacity, if what's the maximum load that the system can handle, or you can do the average. However, that's defined, mean, meaning. And once you have these low profiles, you can connect the dots like we talked about with functional data analysis. That was one of the questions. How many, how many points do you need? As, as little as whatever you have, 24 uh, in this case, or as many as you have. You can build confidence intervals. Um, and I find that's useful instead of just providing a point estimate. You want to provide a little bit more clarity as to what's the variance look like. And then the daily load profile is the most classic uh, decomposition here, but there are others. You can decompose it any other way. And if, you've, if you're a little familiar with time series, you'll know, uh, you'll know what, kind of what that means. I don't, wanna, I don't get into that too much here, but essentially what you're doing is decomposing the time series and summarizing it in some way. And this is our first example. This is time series information. This is an actual customer's uh, meter reads. Um, this is only two weeks. I'm working with about two years worth of data on the back end. That would look very messy if I plotted the whole thing, but this is essentially the underlying data structure. It's a time series. Um, you can see there's not like a, it's not really upward trending or anything, but there's some cyclicality to it, there's ups and downs. So if you've studied time series, you can look this and you can extract information from it. Uh, but it's useful to summarize and decompose this information. And that's where this daily load profile and load profiles in general come in. That's step one. We're going to decompose that time series. And what you're looking at here is uh, two years worth of meter reads. Uh, on the x-axis, you have your day, your 24 hours of the day, uh, and your measure of consumption on the y-axis. Each dot represents a... Uh, a meter read for a particular day and hour, right? So you have about 700 days plotted here. Okay, step one. Step two, we're gonna apply functional data analysis. And I don't show how to do that or anything. This is uh, just to showcase what you can do with it. And this always makes me chuckle because it looks like uh, static on a screen. 
kind of artsy. If you've ever seen those um, those memes or about uh, like deep learning art and what that looks like on the back and the kind of looks like this, it's funny. Um, so what we've done is we fit a functional uh, curve to every day, right? So for the last two years worth of meter reads, we've fit a curve to every one of those days. And uh, you can you can see a couple things from here. I don't, I don't get too into that, but it looks like at the bottom portion of consumption, so from between zero and 400 is where the majority of the consumption for this particular customer in the last two years is. And there's some, there's some uh, like outliers, I guess, out beyond that 400 range. Step three is summarize, right? Because this is useful in to do a couple of different things that we talked about. You can summarize these curves. We can summarize all these curves into a single curve. We can build confidence intervals. Uh, I would never present this to a stakeholder because they would look at you like you're crazy. But this is much more uh, readable, right? So we've summarized all those curves to produce a point estimate curve, right? We fit the curve to these 24 dots, the meter reads. We uh, extracted the standard deviation or the variance component because we had all those curves and we were able to build confidence intervals around that. It allows us to answer questions depending on what that may be. But you could say something like, uh, on average, we are 95% confident that consumption at this point in time is between A and B, right? So a little bit more of a complete picture. And that's the daily load profile, right? But there are other ways to decompose a time series. You could do day a week, day a month, month a year, uh, be creative. There might be seasonal components um, other than that one to 24 hour period. And the, the, those three steps are the same across any of these decompositions. Decompose, uh, you choose your decomposition, you fit functional data analysis, and then you summarize. And, and this is in part hosted by our studio. So I, as I was putting this together, I thought, well, one thing you could do was uh, decompose the time series in a couple of different ways, collect those decompositions, put them together in some in a shiny app a dashboard, and then you would very quickly have a rough idea as to what the average behavior for a customer is. For example, the frown on the top left, um, I probably wouldn't use a, a line for this, but you could, maybe bar chart would be more appropriate, but you see that for this customer, it's a business customer, and you see that consumption is highest between Monday and Friday, and there's an interaction effect on the weekends, right? Consumption drops at the weekends. On the bottom right, you see the month, and consumption tends to be higher on average in the winter months versus the summer. Um, so it's just kind of useful to see experimenting with different things, playing around. It's a, it's a very flexible technique. Okay, second pause. If there are any questions. Yes, there's a few other questions coming in on Slido, but just want to okay. let everyone know again, too, if you want to raise your hand on Zoom uh, or jump in live, feel free to do so as well. Um, but the other questions were, um, someone was often with meter readings, you can have a lot of noise. Do you need to clean the data in advance to remove outliers and other noise in your data? Good question. Um, so we have a whole, I guess I'll answer that in two parts. In the first part, the raw meter reads are cleaned up from a production system by our engineers. Um, so I'm extracting this from an already cleaned state in a database somewhere. Um, I, I don't do too much outside of that. Whatever they've done, I don't do too much. Um, I just take it all in because I'm summarizing that information. If there are outliers, they're kind of taken care of by averaging, right? If, you, if you're afraid of, uh, if, you, if you're afraid that there are too many outliers, instead of summarizing by the mean, you can do the median, um, or you can do a, a pre-processing step to say you want to use. Uh, like, there's so many different ways to uh, define an outlier. However you choose, you could pre-process and eliminate those data points, and then just work with what remains. Um, but I didn't, I didn't do any of that here. I used the whole two years. 
Anything Thank else? you. Yeah, yeah there, there's one other question that was, can the FDA approach be used to estimate deviations from the norm, like theft of electricity? I would imagine. Um, it's, it's a pretty robust technique. I haven't done any sort of anomaly detection, um, but I would imagine you could. Um, for example, if you had an estimate of what normal consumption is, and then all of a sudden there's a spike, you would see that, right? Because if you, if you built a uh, confidence interval around what you thought to be true consumption, true behavior, built your confidence interval to be like know, super wide, 99%, right? Then if something did come in that was way outside of that band, it might be cause to, to, red, to flag it and investigate it further. Um, but I haven't done too much of that. No, there you go. Kelly, thank you. PCA. Um, thank yeah, so you. A lot, a lot of the, that's a good point. A lot of the techniques you're used to, uh, principal component analysis, clustering now, other things, they have functional counterparts. That might be worth exploring. Awesome. Okay, keep going. Uh, derivatives, I found this to be really interesting. Um, I, outside of calculus, didn't think I would use derivatives at work, uh, but it turns out to be really useful. And um, one of the things I'm working on now is sort of a, a feature engineering technique to build the features for machine learning and predictive uh, type work. Um, and I'll show you a little bit about what, what I mean by that. In, it's just opened up a, a new realm of analysis for me that I've been fascinated by. And we're gonna revisit this. We fit this, uh, this curve to this customer. And now we're going to uh, differentiate this curve. And we're gonna look at the velocity and acceleration of, for this particular customer, right? So this average, uh, average behavior curve. And there's a couple of interesting things here. If you look at the, uh, max velocity in the minimum, right? These global global extrema, it, you're almost able to describe some of the behavior of the customer, right? So you can say something like uh, perhaps on peak hours for this particular customer is between 8 a.m. and 5 p.m. Now, knowing that this is a business customer, you're like, yeah, that makes sense. Um, and if you wanted to do, for fun, if you were doing calculus, you could do the second derivative test, right? Where the first derivative is zero, look at the second derivative, is it greater than zero or less than zero? That tells you something about whether that, um, that time is a max or a minimum. Kind of cool. Uh, next, this is a classic, this was new to me. This is a classic uh, way of looking at derivative information in engineering and physics. And it, it's the same information we just looked at, but it's slightly presented in a different manner. Um, it's really good for cyclical type data. Um, in this case, it works really nicely with consumption and meter read type data. And what you see is what we said earlier. All the way to the right on the, the positive, on the x-axis, you have velocity, you see eight. This 8 a.m. is max velocity. If we look all the way to the left, we see 5 p.m. minimum velocity. And then you see these, these cycles, almost these circles, right? You have this big circle to the right in the positive velocity section. You have a small circle center around zero, maybe like a plateau in consumption. And then you have two periods of ramping down in consumption, one bigger than the other. And that's essentially what's happening here, right? Between the hours of four and 10 a.m., the, the consumption for this particular customer on average starts to ramp up and peaks at 8 a.m. And then between, uh, I should have that down, somewhere in the midday, it plateaus. Then you have two periods of ramping down. The primary ramping down period is between about 2 to 8 p.m. 6, 7, yes, about 8 p.m. Then you have a, this final ramping down for the day. It's almost like they're closing up shop for the end of the day. So that's pretty interesting. I, I personally have never looked at it this way. I find it really interesting to describe behavior, um, customer behavior in this way. And it, it's another uh, descriptive feature to add information and context to any analysis you're doing. 
and we can translate translate this back to the original uh, the original data, right? And we have those four periods. And the first period of the day is ramping up. You have this plateau in consumption, that primary ramp down, and then you have that closing up shop period, and then the cycle repeats: ramp up, plateau, ramp down, ramp down. But I, th I found this really fascinating. I thought this was really cool. Um, one of the things I am working on on this as a, as a proof of concept at work is to extract those uh, global extrema using the first derivative as individual on peak periods. Uh, for example, right now uh, at Consumers Energy, let's say we have a predefined window for what we call on peak hours for residential customers. Um, I don't remember how we came up with those, but let's say they're like from A to B. Well, that's, that's very broad and we ask customers to fit into that mold, but using something like derivatives, you can, you can define what on-peak hours are for each customer. So you can be hyper-personalized, be much more customer-centric. Um, so I'm building something now, I'm building a data set for all our customers to define those, on, those personal on-peak uh, hours to potentially use and explore in, as features in other type of works. Let's see, I'll stop there. Uh, any questions, any thoughts? I don't see other questions specific to the top. Oh, I see um, Rajiv, you just asked a question um, on Slido. Would you wanna jump in and ask it live? I can't, oh, I don't have a mic. I'll ask a question, but it is, what are the approaches to account for he, oh my gosh, I'm not going to say this word through my heterogeneity other than fitting separate models to investigate interactions with some X variable like location. Uh, good question. I don't, I haven't done too much of that. My, uh, there's functional regression, which would, uh, would help you with that. Um, if I understood what you're saying correctly, if you had other components and you wanted to do some sort of functional uh, analysis with, you could use functional regression. It's very similar to what you're used to, just with uh, an, a layer up in abstraction with functions or curves, as opposed to individual um, features. Kelly, again, for the win, thank you. I haven't used FPCA on my own. Uh, I know it does, does it on the back end, but I haven't done that too much on my own. Um, what else? Awesome. I see Corin Corin Tema. Apologies if I mispronounce your name. You have your hand raised. If you want to jump in. Hi. I I really like the idea. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Yes. I really like the idea about using the derivatives to find um, the peak periods. So I was thinking of if I have meter reads from let's say a hundred customers and then I wanted to find which customers have the same peak periods. So I could see relatively how I could do it for one and then do it for all of them. But how my general idea is I was thinking I could write a code which would give me, okay, these customers are always, these are the serial numbers of the meters of customers who have peak periods between eight and five. These are customers which have peak periods between six and 10. I, I don't know, that's, that's what I was thinking. Is, is that something where you think this can be applied? Oh. Yeah, that's a good question. And it's very uh, pressing. That's actually exactly what I'm working on right now is once you've defined, it's almost two steps, right? Once you've defined these on-peak periods for all customers, um, you can, you can aggregate that information to construct group level um, on peak periods, right? So let's say I have, for in your example, 100 meter reads, I've defined what the on peak periods are using derivatives. Then you could do one of two things really, you, for your purpose, you would probably just cluster. Um, you could just cluster the, that information and see which customers have similar on peak periods. Um, what else could you do? That's probably, that's probably how I would approach that problem. Uh, and then 
I'm working on a uh, internal white paper that does that very thing. Actually, it um, it it clusters uh, I don't know, about like sixty thousand customers worth of information and defines on peak periods for each cluster. Does that answer the question? Is that kind of what you're thinking? Yes, yes, because um, the type of data I work with is renewable energy. So we wanted to know which people are using so will be best fit for solar energy because their on peak period is in the daytime, which people will be best for other types of energy because their on peak period is in different. Yeah, so that's where I was heading. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's um, actually the questions have been great. That's a perfect segue into the next section. There's been some recent research um, about clustering these curves. So you could, for example, fit a curve to all of your 100 customers and then cluster the curves themselves as opposed to treating the, uh, the time series measurements. Let's say you had 24 hours. Instead of treating the 24 hours as individual features that are highly correlated, you can cluster the curves. Um, and funny enough, that is the next section. <laughs> um, I it's don't... almost like you timed it up perfectly. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it, it's almost, as I've been learning this, this, uh, this technique and applying this, the fitting of the curves, kind of like that, connecting the dots, derivatives, and then clustering has been my progression through this learning process. Uh, the first thing was just getting comfortable and fitting the curves, trying different ways to fit the curves for your uh, for your bases, cubic splines, wavelets, you name it. And then getting the derivative information, how is that useful, building use cases, kind of uh, showing the utility. And then the question came up just like yours, well, what else can we do with that? And it just it just occurred to me, well, I'm in, I'm in marketing a lot of what we do is segmentation and clustering and we want to be more targeted in our messaging and all that. Well, can we cluster these, this information? Can we cluster this stuff? And it turns out you can. And for this, I'm using the hello world example um, of functional data analysis. Uh, there is a package in R called FDA in it. Um, there's this data if you want to get in and play with it. It's from... Um, it's Canadian, it's average Canadian weather temperature uh, for, I, don't know, I think 36 or 50, some number of Canadian stations, some weather stations in Canada for a year, right? So they've averaged this kind of like, it looks almost like a low profile, but instead of being hours, you're looking at days in the year and they've averaged the temperatures. The, the red line there is the average of the group. And uh, before I proceed, Take a look at this and ask yourselves if you had uh, two crayons or coloring pencils or pencils, whatever, and I asked you to color in the lines based on how you would group these things into two different groups, how would you do that, right? Keep that in mind. Um, how we've done it traditionally at work has been to treat the features, in this case, uh, hours of the year, or days of the year. Uh, in my case, it's been hours of the day, once you throw in 24. In this example, it's 1 through 365. Treat those features as features in a clustering, uh, in a traditional clustering process. Um, the features are highly correlated, right? They're dependent on each other. So you do some kind of dimension reduction technique, principal component analysis, for example. In this case, I extracted two PCs. That was like 95 or 97% of the variance. And this is what comes out. Um, and it looks, it looks like it makes sense, right? So there's not really any questions. It looks um, pretty straightforward. And this is your traditional clustering. PCA, dimension reduction if you need it, and you do need it, and then k-means. You could probably do hierarchical clustering as well, extract to um, so many different approaches. It's just k-means. And then uh, this is relatively newer. Uh, this is clustering the curves themselves via something, it's a library in R called Fun HDDC. Um, I, think, I think the first paper describing this came out 2017, 2015 maybe, I'm not sure, but it's recent. Uh, and it does something very similar. 
uh, but in a, from a functional perspective. And it looks very different from the, the, the clustering outcome looks very different from the traditional clustering measure. So this is, this is why early on I said, it's a, another tool in your toolbox. Um, different results, it depends on your use case. Maybe this better aligns with your, what your needs are. Um, to me, when I looked at that black and white curve, the black and white lines and originally, this aligns more with what I thought, funny enough. Um, but then I've asked others in preparation for the presentation and they said the traditional lined up more with what they thought. That's kind of interesting. Um, that is it for that section. I don't, I haven't explored this too in depth. I do have another project I'm working on with a colleague to uh, build this out in more detail and comparing the different approaches to see if this curve clustering idea is something that we want to adopt uh, and replace or have in addition to um, our traditional clustering processes. Awesome. I know on the topic of packages, because you just mentioned FDA, someone else had asked, um, are there other packages that you could recommend to us for functional data analysis? Yeah, absolutely. Um, FDA is classic. Uh, Matthew mentions the refund the package. That's really good. Um, there's a supplemental package to FDA called FDA. USC, I think, and it, it gives you a little bit more uh, functionality. For example, in FDA, you can average the curves through the mean. Uh, with this supplemental package, you can do uh, the median and a bunch of other stuff. Uh, there's a couple clustering. Actually, if you wait a second, I have resources. Um, I would recommend to visit the R CRAN task view. This is really neat. They have a running list of all available functional data analysis libraries in R. That's, um, that's how I discovered the clustering portion. I, there's a small snippet there that describes the different techniques for cl curve clustering. Um, let's see. I would say just visit that, explore. Um, I got started on this journey uh, in school, actually. We were learning about splines and uh, GAMs, generalized additive models. And I was really interested with the idea and I asked my professor where I could get more information about functional data analysis. And my professor pointed me towards work, uh, work by Professor Ramsey. Um, so I purchased these two books here, functional data analysis. It's, it's theoretical, it's the math behind things. It's really good for understanding what the heck's going on in the background. Uh, for an applied perspective, functional data analysis with R and MATLAB is a great resource. I actually have it right here. Uh, I was doing something this morning with it. And I reference that all the time. Um, there are also really great uh, public posts. Um, Joseph, I believe is an RStudio employee. He has three or four posts on R views that are really good. Um, there's an online course that's in depth and quite lengthy and I'm sure it would cover your questions. There's, if you're interested in GAMs specifically, um, there's a great course by Noam Ross on that information. Um, there are other books too that are really good that I haven't purchased. I've only stuck with these two. And then the R, in, in summary, the R ecosystem for functional ability analysis is really rich. If you want to do something, it's there. Um, and then I do know there are a few resources in Python as well. Uh, and that is it. That's all I had. Um, Thank you so much, Santiago. I, that was awesome. I, I see there's a lot of other great questions here too. But on that topic of all those great resources, I did just want to say to everyone as well, if you have other things to share too, feel free to put them into the chat as well or other things that have been helpful for you in, in learning FDA. Yeah, there's a... There's a Joseph, one of Joseph's posts on RView, the, the RView's blog, shows a, uh, it looks like, um, shoot, I'm drawing, a, I'm drawing a blank on the name, but it's, it's a map of uh, 
but how the different packages relate to each other. And at the center is the refund package that's getting a lot of love in the chat, um, in the chat section, but also FDA. The FDA package and the refund package are pretty much the source of all newer works. That's really cool. I would say check that out. That's a really neat um, image. Um, yeah, there's a lot of out there. Cool. The ecosystem's so rich. Explore if you're interested. Thank you. Uh, let me go over to some of the Slido questions. Um, and as a reminder, you can always raise your hand on Zoom too if you want to ask live. Um, let's see. Their question was on the weather time series analysis. Um, let's see. On the weather time series analysis, based on what criteria will we give color? I'm not understanding the question exactly. Um, so feel, feel free to weigh in um, if you want to add any other context to that question too, or Santiago, if you understand what they might be asking there. I think I get it. Um, in the traditional clustering paradigm, you can, since our features are so related, you're dealing with collinearity, um, dimension reduction is almost a necessity, right? So using PCA on the features, treating them like independent features and extracting some PCs is the way to go. And that's, I would say, that I think that answers that question from a traditional perspective. From a curve clustering perspective, it's doing pretty much the same thing. It's doing like uh, you've seen in the chat probably that functional PCA, it's doing that on the background in the back end too um, and extracting some kind of variance and uh, like extracting the PCs based on some kind of variance metric, maybe. I honestly haven't explored the inner workings too much. Um, I find it useful to focus on applications first. And if it's if I can do, if I can do it, first of all, and then um, and then I can it meets my needs, then I go back and I start reading a little bit more about the information, the details. Uh, for example, I've read the research paper a little bit to understand what's going on, like what's the background. And it's pretty, it's pretty understandable if you have some understanding of, uh, like it's not, it's not so academic that it's beyond reach. Um, for example, the F Fun HDDC has a, has a, their papers, it's pretty approachable. I would say check it out to have a good understanding of what it's, what it's doing. But it, it's, it's like the functional counterpart to traditional clustering. It's doing very similar things. Thank you. I see someone else said, I know the GAMS course or GAM. What is the difference between GAMS and FDA? Are they the same thing? Uh, sort of. Um, GAM, yeah, I mean, yes, I guess in short, yes. Uh, GAMS use cubic spline so that if you remember that, uh, that early math formula, the linear combination, if you think of like the regression component, you have your intercept and then you have beta. You have your coefficient times some data, coefficient times some data. That phi function builds out um, the, the data component, the non-parametric data component, right? That non-parametric function. There are different ways to fit that. In GAMS, I don't know if you can switch that. Um, I've only ever seen it with cubic splines, um, in which case that is FDA, that is functional data analysis. Um, Let's see, you could generalize further and do maybe like um, functional regression on your own using the, the functional data analysis techniques um, and then define that fee function as whatever you want it for your, the four year series, wavelets, monotone, polynomial, whatever. But I think GAMS specifically use cubic ones. Thank you. Uh, Thomas, I saw you had your hand raised earlier, um, if you want to jump in with your question. Or maybe it was answered from Slido, but feel free to, to jump in again. Um, but Kelly, I see you just asked a question in the chat too, if you want to ask live. Oh, I can always ask the questions for people too. Feel free to put a little, like I should have said that, sorry, a star next to your question if you ask in the Zoom chat too and want me to ask it. 
Um, but the question was curious to know if anyone also tried using uh, wavelet for curve modeling. I haven't yet. Um, in one of the textbooks by Professor Ramsey, he touts it as a that's supposed to be pretty good. I haven't really worked with it too much. I've mostly stuck with the Fourier series, the Fourier uh, bases expansion, and cube explains. For meter oh, reads, you. for meter reads, I found the Fourier uh, series, the Fourier bases functions work really well. Um, in except in rare cases where, um, like I've seen this in I've seen this in business customers more where. Consumption could be, uh, well, let me collect my thoughts. The Fourier series works really well for periodic data, right? Because uh, it's built by sines and cosines, and but it doesn't do very well when things are, uh, like if something's jagged, it doesn't jump up very well. It doesn't adjust up to these, um, there's a term, but I'm blanking on it. Like if your consumption was like this, right? You go from nothing straight up, back down, these very jagged rises and peaks, Fourier series won't approximate that very well. Cubic splines would fit that much better. Um, but there are downsides to that too, right? Uh, you just have to account for differential, differential, differentiability if that's what you're interested in. Or um, the endpoints with cubic splines can be kind of wonky. So if you're trying, if you're doing something there, that might get weird. Um, anyway. Well, thank you so much. Um, I think, oh, there was a question earlier um, from someone that was more related to uh, like a coding question. The anonymous question was, they need to know how to change the data class for all variables from double to original class um, without doing it manually when they import a CSV file. And a few people were helping in the, the chat as well, um, but their question Further question was, they want to change everything for like 50 variables at once and how to do that. Um, I know exactly. it's hard to kind of ask coding questions here. It, it does, does that yeah, make sense? Okay. Yeah, that's actually pretty easy. Um, and all thanks to the Tidyverse, funny enough. So shout out our studio. Um, using stuff like uh, the across function, dplyr our across, you select your fields, for example, if you were interested in, uh, if there was all fields, it'd be super easy. If you needed a certain number of fields, you can do something like dplyr our across, uh, columns, select where uh, contains, for example, if you have a set prefix or suffix or something, and then function would be whatever you need to adjust it by. Um, I, I saw as part of this, uh, since I'm using actual customer information, uh, I have to add noise to meet compliance standards and all that stuff. And I, I take, I do that very thing. I take, I read in the data, the raw data, and then I do, uh, using the tidyverse, I do an across function, apply noise. Um, and then that just takes care of everything auto automatically. There's probably other ways to do it, but the tidyverse would be uh, probably my go-to. It's easy. Thank you. And I just want to make sure that answered whoever's question. I'm that was, um, feel free to respond back anonymously in Slido too. And if not, you can always ask me one-on-one -on -one as well. Um, and then another question was, how often do you need to refit the curves uh, or clustering? Um, I mean, it depends. It's almost, uh, if I were to generalize that a little bit further, if you were, depending on what you were doing. If you were doing a one-off analysis, then only once, right? But if you were putting this into production to do something um, like predicting something or clustering groups of customers, then you're entering a broader conversation about when do you retune models in general, right? So if you're doing something in production, you should have uh, some sort of like data drift type uh, pipelines to assess as your data changed. Um, there was a previous comment about outliers. If, if, um, if your input data has tended to be one way and then all of a sudden just behavior changes, let's say due to COVID or some, something else, then it's probably time to retune, right? You should have a flag that says, hey, just a heads up or even break your procedure to say, 
Uh, your input data is way different than what it used to be. Um, that's kind of like a broader topic. There's no, I don't think there's a set defined period, uh, but there's a lot of research out there to help guide that conversation as to when, how often, and it probably depends on the nature of your data too. If you're doing something at the daily level, it's probably more frequent. If you're working on aggregate, aggregated yearly meter reads, then once or twice a year, once or twice a year would probably suffice. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Corin, Tema, I see you have your hand raised too, if you wanna to jump in. Hi, uh, yes, I was still thinking about the clustering and I was thinking about what if there's a shift, there's sort of bias in the data in, in terms of for my 100 customers, I do not have data, the same amount of data. For one customer, I only have data for one month and then maybe a couple of days in one month. And for some customers, I have every day for six months. And like for that variation, would that affect in the clustering? Uh, it shouldn't. The, the functional data analysis techniques are really robust. Um, for, in my cases, since, I'm, since I've typically worked with, uh, like I'll, I'll prep the data, right? I will look at only customers who have had at least six months of of meter reads, um, I'll eliminate anywhere where consumption is zero because some people might just activate a meter and never use it, right? Um, get rid of those people. So if you prep, I've used, uh, what do you call it? Uh, equally spaced basis functions. Um, like the, the, they're called knots. Uh, the number of knots can be equally spaced in my case. For example, in this in the presentation today, there are 24, right? Because I'm, I'm working 24 hours in the day. So I define a knot at each hour of the day. But let's say in your case, you had um, month one, month two, month five, month seven, month 12, and you wouldn't use equally spaced knots because you don't have them. What you might do is fit curves individually to each customer using whatever data you do have, whatever, like whatever periods you have, right? whatever knots you have, define those for each and each customer, and then work with those, uh, the respective curves. Um, for, for example, with my work, since I don't have that issue, I can work with all the customers at once. Um, in, that, uh, in that clustering, no. In the, actually, yeah, in the, the white paper I was telling you about, I'm, I'm working with, it's about 60,000 customers yeah, so it's a, it's a matrix of by 60,000 60, and by, uh, no, it's the other way. It's 24 and by 60,000 P, right? So my customers are, my features are really wide. I can just treat them all at once because the data is the same. It's 20, they have some data for all 24 hours. It makes it really easy. Um, in your case, the only thing that really switches is you might have to fit curves to each individual customer and then work with that the, the output like those those uh those curves as opposed to working with them all at once thank you let me just check to yeah. see if there are other questions i know a few people okay. have to drop right at the top of the hour so just did just want to let you know i shared a few links in the chat if you ever want to provide feedback for the meetups um, if you are interested in speaking at a future meetup, whether that's energy or another industry that you work in, um, and then also a calendar of, of upcoming events too. One last question that was on the slide of Santiago was um, someone asked if you would be able to share this code for them to try it, or if you have that shared on GitHub somewhere. I don't, um, only because it's, it's customer information. I don't, I had, I had to meet compliance needs and standards and go through a whole uh, process. So I don't know if I can share. Um, I could certainly share the presentation, but I don't know if I can share any code. Uh, I might be able to create a markdown type file and just hide that chunk so you don't see anything there, but still show the steps after the fact. I might be able to do that, uh, but I don't know. Okay, thank you. I can follow up with you after and 
Um, I'll share all the resources and slides with the recording as well. So that will go up to the Art Studio YouTube. And I'll put that playlist here for all the meetups in the chat too. Um, so I'll work on hopefully sharing that by the end of the day tomorrow too. I'll do one last check for, for any questions. Feel free to unmute yourself and, and jump in. I'll try to count at least seven seconds here. <laughs> Thank you so much, Santiago, for an awesome presentation and, and sharing all those resources with us too. Yeah, I no, really appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.